yes, uh, Dr. Kipp, so I think I wanted to ask you about uh, anticoagulation and abrutinib. Um, uh, there's no absolute contraindication to it, and I think about it more in Waldenstrom's, which I do treat. Uh, but I, do you do you generally try to avoid it completely? The use of full anticoagulation, like warfarin or one of the NOACs. This is a very I think it's an excellent question. That's actually going to be a um, data analysis over all takers. I think that the risk of bleeding is increased when you have systemic anticoagulation. Uh, because ibrutinib does act as a uh, antiplatelet agent, and um, uh, however, it's not a direct contraindication as you mentioned. I think it may be also predicated on platelet counts and the functionality of the platelets. For patients who are now thrombocytopenic who require anticoagulation therapy, I think it may be too much. So I'm very loath to use it if I have a patient who has platelet count below, below 80,000, who uh, the cardiologist just needs anticoagulation. Um, and I'd seek alternative treatments for that patient. Um, but this is a, a problem. I've had some patients who, after just falling, have sustained major uh, intracranial hemorrhages, and it's, so it's not a pretty situation to have. Um, but I have had patients who have been anticoagulated uh, either with uh, warfarin, which becomes problematic, uh, or some of the other anticoagulants that have done okay, provided their platelet counts were within the normal range. Uh, so I think it might be a numbers thing. Um, and I, we're trying to analyze what are the factors that might be associated with more severe bleeding episodes uh, with the brutinib. We're not sure whether a calibrutinib will have the same thing. It seems to be a um, BTK-related effect, and so whether even improved specificity of the drug is going to allow it to mitigate these. The early going is that there hasn't been a lot of severe bleeding complications with the calibrutinib. But the most severe bleeding complications with the brutinib happened early on when the antiplatelet activity was not realized. Patients came on with severe thrombocytopenia who were on warfarin. That's when you had real trouble. Yeah, of course, we, we need data because we know people who are on anticoagulants have intracranial bleeding, whether or not they're on the brutinib. That's so, correct. So uh, you can't necessarily associate the two. I think you're absolutely correct. And so uh, anticoagulation is hazardous. Um, and independent of using ibrutinib. Um, and so just like atrial fibrillation in the elderly patients, uh, it's not like it's 0% patients developing atrial fibrillation. So in the control comparator group with ofatumumab versus ibrutinib, there was a 1% increment of atrial fibrillation in the comparator group. Granted, it was significantly lower than the 6% seen with the ibrutinib treated group, but it was a, uh, clearly that there was an increase, but it's not like these patients don't have that complication as well. So you're absolutely correct. Um, and I think what we need to do is understand what the basis of the risk is, um, whether it would be interesting, throw this out with cardiologists, whether the ibrutinib treatment may obviate the use of, say, things such as low-dose aspirin or what have you. Um, those kind of studies need to be done. Uh, delighted when our patients uh, do well and respond to therapy. Uh, we're learning that's not so easy for us uh, country doctors now. We have uh, pseudo progression with the checkpoint inhibitors. We learned today that the CAR T cell therapy can be associated with that. And of course, we know with glutenib that we see a lymphocytosis in many patients. So, can you offer us a kind of rule of thumb? How high do you see it go? How long do you see it go before you decide that glutenib is not working? Well, I think, um, if I understand the question, how long do we wait before we decide the patient is not uh, being treated? Well, I think what you have to do, um, we're looking at whether they develop mutations in BTK, but I would have to say that that's not the only basis for resistance. Uh, perhaps it's been uh, argued to be the majority, but I don't think so. We have mutations in downstream kinases, such as PLC gamma, and other factors, adapter proteins. Uh, that account for resistance. So clinically, I think it's very important. If the patient's taking the drug and they swear up and down they're taking the drug, uh, if they start developing increased lymphadenopathy by your exam or increasing lymphocytosis after having been sustained for some time, that's a real flag. And so you start seeing the disease start to progress. What to do? It's very important to maintain a cool head because if you take them off ibrutinib, you have to have a plan for what to do with them. And so it's very critical because they may be slowly progressing on the drug, but then you take off the drug and you could see very rapid progression. Now, um, we've transitioned some of these patients onto venetoclax. 
And I remember one patient who was developing resistance to abrutinib, and it wasn't a BTK mutation, but the patient was developing resistance. When we had to stop the abrutinib because of the protocol dictated it, she started to take off. Her LDH zoomed up to over 600 and up to 900. And uh, we had to start the venetoclax and dose escalate. And I was worried that we wouldn't be able to get up to the dose that would be required to contain her fast enough. And fortunately, we were able to. It was almost like, uh, and now she's doing quite well. She's into uh, what appears to be a CR with the venetoclax. So, um, but it, it's very important that you have a plan of attack or some, something in mind for the patient. So that's the situation where someone's being treated and they develop resistance. Uh, I'm more concerned about the initiation of therapy when you start treatment and you see a significant rise in lymphocytes, which you might expect to see. How do you gauge whether, in fact, you have primary resistance? Well, I think the. Waited out? I understand the question is how, when they start therapy, you see the lymphocytosis. Yeah, that's pretty common, and it's not necessarily um, a bad thing. I would suggest that usually it's concomitant with the shrinkage in the lymph nodes. So it's a redistribution effect and shouldn't by itself raise alarm. It typically will peak two to three months after starting therapy and start to come down slowly and over time. But we've had patients on the drug now for years who still have persistent lymph nodes greater than three or four centimeters are uh, lymphocytosis in the marrow. It gives you some careful caution. I think with regard to patients, uh, my experience has been that patients on the clinical trial have been more having having more fortitude with the, tr the drug than patients that you just randomly prescribe the drug. My experience is that when you tell a patient to take ibrutinib and they're not a clinical trial patient, they are a little bit more fastidious in terms of what they tolerate. And there is a low level of fatigue that some patients have. I've had some patients with grade three fatigue on ibrutinib that clearly seems to be drug related. You stop the drug and they feel better. Um, so you have to be careful because patients have to understand what they are getting into and you have to counsel them that maybe if they tough it out, things will get better. But sometimes patients just don't tolerate the drug very well at all. Um, I must say that we've had now some patients who, I would say particularly those ones that have mutated antibody genes, low risk factors, who are on abrutinib, may have a less of a therapeutic index, may have less to gain with the therapy, and they may have more complaints about some of the adverse effects. When we stop some of those patients, particularly if they have a low tumor burden, we've not seen the disease take off. Um, and it's been reassuring that, that not every patient takes off right away when you stop the abrutinib. But it's clear that when you do stop abrutinib, before you do it, you should have the next approach there ready to go with close follow-up to make sure that you can take care of uh, really rapid disease progression. Any other questions? All right, I have one question for Dr. Yogan. Dr. Yogan, can you educate me when you would consider stem cell transplant for MDS patients? Yeah, so uh, stem cell transplant is obviously still the only treatment we have that's a cure. And uh, I would consider it for every patient who is eligible. Okay. For African Americans or minorities who do not have a uh, matched uh, uh, sibling, what would you do in those patients? Would you still offer? Transplant, haploidentical, or well, I I send them to my transplanter if they're young enough, and uh, you know so that everybody has the the facts, and uh, but as you know, it's very often just not realistic. Uh, and I just try and maximize the utility of of the decitabine and the five A's of cytidine. You you will be surprised how many years you can keep patients going. You know, uh, if you are willing to settle for an absence of a CR, if uh, uh, you don't need CR, you just need them to have satisfactory blood counts. You need a platelet count of 21, you know, hemoglobin at 10.2, neutrophil count of 600. People can live for years and years, as so long as we don't poison them by giving, by by trying to make the numbers prettier. And then the trade-off is uh, so much of what we do has a bad therapeutic index. It's counterproductive. It kills those precious, normal hematopoietic stem cells. They need every single one of them to sustain those blood counts. Sure. Uh, I didn't have time to go into it, uh, but, but that is the challenge in the myeloid versus the lymphoid world is uh, myeloid, you know, it, we need those good cells. 
uh, the therapeutic index of our agents intrinsically because they're targeting myeloid is very close, close to killing the good myeloid, that they absolutely need to be alive. Uh, but we do have drugs out there that can help uh, good myeloid cells grow. Uh, Danazol, uh, making sure that there's enough EPO on board, uh, using GCSF uh, as needed, um, and now l um, uh making sure that uh, iron chelation is, is introduced you know, at, a, at a good time, uh, and we can keep patients going for years, even if there isn't a pretty CR. Is there any role for maintenance uh, decitabine or azacitidine after transplant? Uh, I think it's a no-brainer that uh, we should be exploring use of these drugs, uh, but again, in a sensible, scientifically rational way, uh, where they're being used purely for an epigenetic uh, therapeutic effect and not uh, like cytarabine. Uh, and uh, we, we, but it needs to be studied more but, you know, obviously the, the big problem is uh, uh, in our high-risk uh, myeloid malignancy patients, it's relapse after transplant. And these agents, if used right, do have a good therapeutic index. You can preserve the, the graft uh, and get that, that malignant host hematopoiesis if you use the drugs uh, the right way. Uh, the other thing is uh, there are oral versions of these drugs that are being developed. Uh, the cell gene drug is just shoveling more 5 asa down the gullet. Uh, I'm not sure how rational that is, but uh, Aztex or Tsuka has a combination of oral decitabine with an inhibitor of cytidine deaminase, and there's an academically developed conflict of interest. Uh, we're developing an academically uh, uh, developed version of uh, oral decitabine in combination with a cytidine deaminase inhibitor. So we get the low Cmax and the extended Tmax that you need for uh, pure green zone, non-cytotoxic, uh, epigenetic therapeutic effect, I think that will open the door to, you know, uh, trials in the maintenance setting. It's hard to, to tell patients who, who feel well to come, you know, every month to get injections. So I think if we have an oral drug, uh, we can better address the uh, maintenance question. Now, as far as EPO, which is commonly used for uh, uh, in MDS patients, as you know, EPO promotes tumor growth. So some patients come there and ask us, uh, well, EPO causes cancer. Why would you give EPO to me when I'm prone to developing AML? Yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't use EPO. As you know, in the, in the old days, we'd give it uh, chemotherapy, and there was reimbursement advantages that were driving a lot, a lot of that maybe. Uh, but in the case of a patient who's red cell transfusion dependent and has an EPO level of 190, it's clearly inappropriately low. Uh, I don't view it as, uh, I view it as replacement therapy, like giving vitamin D to somebody who's vitamin D deficient. There's supposed to be EPO there, they're red cell transfusion dependent on giving replacement therapy. Okay, sure. Any other questions? All right, so this is the last session of the day, but don't forget we have one CME biosimilar talk. It is at 5.30 in, in uh, Casco Bay in front of Exhibit Hall. So I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, and thank you so much.